You may have heard his music on airwaves overseas or been introduced to his music here in the U.S. Recording artist Teddy Bryant recently dropped his latest album, and he joins me next on an all-new RXG Exclusives. We must open up our minds and take a look inside At that we find we hold all the answers tonight. You're watching the award-winning RXG Exclusives Hosted by award-winning actor and award-winning filmmaker Robert X. Golfin. At the age of 14, my guest co-founded the jazz ensemble Irvine with family members. Their debut album, Expressions of Love, showcased his prodigious talents as a vocalist, composer, producer, songwriter, playing across European airwaves. He draws inspiration from the likes of legendary figures Marvin Gaye and Sade, but perhaps some of his greatest influences come from his own musically inclined family. He grew up watching his father, the revered jazz and soul saxophonist Norman the Storm Bryant, take the stage nationwide. In 2020, my guest released his debut solo album, In the Beginning, and earlier this year, his sophomore effort, Dinner for Two. I'm pleased to welcome to the program, Mr. Teddy Bryant. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So let's dive right in. How does your music reflect both you as an artist and as a person? I imagine the two aspects aren't necessarily synonymous. Well, uh, as an artist, my, my music, it, it stems from a long, long uh, uh, league of musicians being around them, listening to the things that they enjoyed, watching my father play on stage with his band. And I always knew at a very young age, I wanted to definitely play music. And my father, uh, he inculcated music in our entire family. My siblings, my two brothers play trumpet. My sister plays the flute. My older brother and my older sister, they're both naturally very great vocalists. Um, and so for me, I, I just, I wanted to kind of have my hands in everything. Um, and I used to watch, you know, on TBS back in the day, uh, when Purple Rain came on, I, I just thought Prince was the coolest thing, man. Um, and when I, when I saw him on stage, I was like, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, you know, and at the age of four, four going on five, I wrote my first song called Desire. And I wrote that on my, uh, my mom's old busted acoustic guitar. Um, it was more of a country song than anything. Uh, but not, nonetheless, um, at, at the music that I am inspired by is music that uh, the legends put out, uh, true talent, um, otherworldly type talent. Um, and that that made me want to be as good as the folks I was listening to. Um, and and as a person, um, as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, we, we do our best to help people uh, learn the truths that are in the Bible. Um, and my life is solely built upon my relationship with the almighty God, Jehovah. So I, I, I do my best to make sure that me as an artist and me as a person, the things that I create, um, uh, the music that I create, the art that I create, uh, that it reflects uh, all of those different variations um, that play a huge part uh, in my life. Well, listen, I'm a singer, and even though I got a guitar for Christmas a few years ago, I have yet to learn the thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about the instruments you play, what the learning curve was like, and which ones are your favorites? Um, my my instrument, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to be so honest with you, bro. I My favorite instrument, of course, is the piano. I, I, that's the one that I had the most, um, uh, I guess, ability on. Um, well, besides the horns, I, I grew up playing, you probably can't see it, but back here I have my clarinet, my saxophone right in the back behind me. Um, and, I, and so I grew up playing woodwind instruments. So those, I can pick that up and play it, you know, just like I started playing it years ago. But um, I, A house full of prodigies, you ought to be able to do that, right? <laughs> I'm, I am no prodigy, man. I, I, um, <laughs> I tell you this, 
I I uh I dibble dabble in a lot of different instruments and I do just enough to make the music that I want to make. I I I wish I put uh more time into uh the bass and guitar the way that I put into the piano, but I, I fell so in love with it that it kind of just took over. And I at this time I want to shout out my um my jazz piano teacher, um, Mr. Ray Lushlight Turner, he's no longer with us. Um, but he taught me seven major seven chords. And from those seven chords, every other thing fell in place. And it was like, man, my, my imagination went wild. And so I, you know, self-taught, I, I, I did as much as I could. And that's why the piano now is my favorite. I, I do a little bass, a little guitar, but, but like I said, just enough to get the music I want out, you know, out. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I do a little bit of that, um, sax, clarinet, um, and hopefully soon some flute. I'm, I got a flute coming in. Um, I'm going to be messing around with that as well, but I, you know, I'm, I'm no, I'm no Esperanza Spalding. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you hail from one of my family's home states, South Carolina. Can you share your take on the Southern music industry versus the North and East Coast versus the West? Okay. And also, do, do musicians have to navigate those terrains differently in order to achieve success, in your opinion? 100%. Um, in, in the South, I live in Conway, South Carolina, which is close to Myrtle Beach. Um, here, there's a lot of, and as you would know, uh, people love country music down here. Um, nonetheless, uh, there's a lot of blues and bluegrass, and there's a lot of swing music, what people might call beach music. Um, my dad's band, Just For Fun, growing up, they did a lot of Motown um, that was mixed in with some some James Brown, some Chick Corea. They, they really mixed it up because, uh, again, people here, they want to they wanna groove, they want to move. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the scene here. And two, also, the, the jazz scene is not as heavy here, not in Conway, in Myrtle Beach. Now, Columbia, Charleston, jazz scene is heavy. But here where I'm at, it's, you know, it's kind of like, it's, it's subpar. Um, uh, and so now on the, on the North end, like where my cousins live, um, my father's from Queens, New York, him and his cousin, Tom Rhodes, who is on the album, by the way, playing flute. Um, they, they reign from, uh, Linden Boulevard. And so they used to, all the jazz stuff that used to come right into town, they would go check out the concerts, and that's how they fell in love with jazz. Um, John Coltrane, uh, Stanley Tarantine, um, Gato Babietti, you know, the greats, man, Grover Washington Jr. Um, and, and so the music scene uh, in the North really uh, has a great avenue for uh, soul, neo-soul, or what I would like to call acid jazz, which is a mixture of uh, basically hip-hop and jazz, hip-hop percussions. May remind you of what the roots does, just a little, a little more complicated. Um, and so I, that that avenue for me was like, okay, well, once I get of age, I'm I'm going to move to New York. Um, and I also have family in Rochester, New York, which also has a wonderful musical lane for basically all types of music. Um, and the college scene really helps out with that as well. But as an artist, you got to navigate through all of this stuff. Um, the West Coast. Um, Places like uh, San Diego, um, places near the Bay, they have their own music scene. And 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 you, you, you know probably more better than I do um, the type of music that people in the West Coast that they want to hear. And um, but I will say this, the love that I that I get from L.A., the love that I get over on that end is amazing. It is amazing. And um, I, I, I got I got to give a shout out to your boy, man. Um, Brian McKnight Jr. Yeah, it's um well, yeah, um, wow. of the show, Vocals of the show. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I need you to make this happen for me, bro. I, I have to make it. I, I, I have to do it with my brother. I have to. I, I, him and Nico. Nico was bizarrely talented on the guitar. He reminds me of Prince yeah. on the guitar. I have to yeah. say that. These guys are, these guys are, I, I love what they do. And uh, we got to make this happen. I spoke with Miss Julia as well. I wanted her to get on a house track I had on this on this album. I have two house tracks on this album. Um, and she was very kind, very nice. And, and I, I, I just got to make that happen. So hopefully on my third one, uh, which is going to be out in 2025, we, we're going to try to make that happen. But, but again, going back to your question, just traversing through all these different avenues as a musician, you have to know your audience. And I think within this, 
uh, Instagram, Twitter type world that we live in, um, it's it makes it a tad bit easier to know the people that like your music. Nonetheless, they have to show and prove whenever that music is released. And so you want to you want to make sure that you making music that that their ears are going to want to listen to over and over and over again. And that can be a little tough, man. Um, so, yeah. you know, we, we we as independent musicians, we have to continue just to strive to really be who we are, be unique, make the music that we like. And the goal is to make the listener like what you like, you know. And so it's it's like you said, it's it's a it's kind of a it's a swirly thing to traverse sometimes. Well, my union and the Screen Actors Guild recently concluded a 100 plus day strike with artificial intelligence being among our chief concerns. In this age of rapid technological advancement, fear of the unknown may not be the answer. However, safeguarding artists and their craft from AI exploitation is paramount. Earlier this year, the industry panicked when an AI generated song was put up for Grammy consideration. How do we strategize yeah. effective and realistic solutions to ensure that artists and their work are protected and supported? This is why I wanted to interview with you. This is one you asked. I've been asked a lot of great questions. That's probably one. That's number one. That's probably at the top. Uh, amazing. Thank you for that wonderful question. This is this is the answer that I think is the answer. I'm not saying this to be all end all, okay? The issue with AI is really, really simple. We are allowing artists not to put in the work to become great artists. Let's mm -hmm. I, I'll give you a perfect example. Okay. Um anybody right now can go to Best Buy and get the tools to have a studio in their home. That's all good. That's great. But it has now been made so easy through technology to just pull samples and, and drums, patterns, chord patterns and make music. That that enough was hard for people who, like myself, grew up playing instruments, having to, you know, I'm talking over 30 years of being involved in putting my hands on instruments, playing, singing and trying to actually use my brain to create uh, with, without using other people's, I guess, uh, with other people's music. It's, it's hard to do. The AI situation is even scarier than that now. Now, besides dealing with that, we, ha we now have to deal with a computer that can grab information from everywhere <laughs> and mimic your voice, okay, and take it to a whole nother level. Uh, and, 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 and then now be a, a nom nominated for a, 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 a Grammy. Like you, that doesn't make sense. Not, as a matter of fact, would you do that with, uh, some of the great painters that we've had on this, on this planet? You know, I can't think of any names right now, but I'm, you, you, you obviously know, Van, uh, as Van Gogh, I guess, will we, will we take one of his paintings and allow a computer to computer generate that and then sell it? No, somebody would get fined and sued. So why are we doing it with music? The reason why it's being done is because streaming services like Spotify, all of them, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to keep it real with you. All the streaming services, they have really hurt this art form that I love. To where music is no longer looked at as, as an art form because it's made it so easy for anybody to be a quote unquote artist without really having talent. It's just a fact. It's just a fact. And we can see that by the way Spotify is doing people right now and has been doing people right now uh, for, well, for the longest where these artists can't get paid for their work. <laughs> I got to have a gazillion streams to make a dollar. Make that make sense. The, 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 so in my opinion, the way that we kill all of this stuff is get back to doing music the way it was done when the greats were on stage with Michael, Prince, Marvin, James, Ingram, all, all, Anita Baker. So I, I can go on and on and on where the artist has to show and prove talent. Okay. Number one. And number two, let's get back to selling hard copies. That way the artists can get paid for the art that they do. And, and, and I think that, and, and also too, there's a lack of love 
for music. People are just doing it as a gimmick to make money. That's why we have auto tune and auto correction where you don't have you don't have to know how to sing anymore. You know, and, and, and we have, of course, labels on the streaming companies. So if the labels say, yeah, AI is great, we should use it. Then, then what, what can we as independent artists do? Absolutely nothing. We don't have the funding to fight big businesses like that. And so we, we are living in changing time. We're living in the last days. So I, I understand why this, these things are happening, but it's just making it very hard for people like you and I who love the art, uh, and who, and who spent the time to be good at what we do. It's making it hard for us to make a living on the art form that we that we do. That's very unique and, uh, and creative and imaginative to ourselves. Whenever you are fighting against a supercomputer with all the information in the world, so you know, let's let's artists need to come together, form a uh, form a union, to where we have some fighting power, to where we can decide how our music should be. Uh, possessed and sold. Um, and until then, we're just going to continue to see this get worse. Now, I will say this, and, and I'll finish my point. AI is good for certain things. Um, I, for folks who maybe lost their voice, who maybe want to get do more music, I, you know, I, I, I think that might be a, a great idea for those situations. But as, as far as something completely of AI winning a Grammy over Someone who spent a whole year creating unique work. I, I don't think that's fair at all. But that's just my opinion. Don't come after me in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's stay with business for a moment. Uh, Taylor Swift made industry shockwaves when she decided to re-record her albums after not being able to acquire her masters. Billboard reported that in light of her massive success, she recently was... Uh, Time Magazine's Person of the Year, record labels are now taking steps to prevent new artists from re-recording their songs for prolonged periods of time, and in some cases, maybe even never. Should artists, especially newcomers, simply play the game and be content with just securing the deal, or should they stand up and fight for what they believe is fair? Stand up and fight for what you believe is fair. It this is all based on morality. Um, and, and, and in all honesty, I know we're living in tough times. People need money. And, and, and everybody, you know how it was, but everybody wanted a deal until they find out what those deals uh, consisted of. You talking 360 deals. Let's just face it. Labels are not here to help you as an artist. They are here to make money off of you as an artist. The Taylor Swift situation should have never happened. I believe this child wrote her own music and performed the music. So why shouldn't she have control over her music? Prince years ago, and you, you remember this, uh, when Prince wrote Slave on his face, he went through that whole ordeal with Time Warner where they owned his masters. Prince, how, how can Time Warner own Prince's masters? Well, they say, well, Prince, you signed the contract. Well, that, well that's not fair. Not, a, not if I wrote, performed, composed, arranged, and did everything and then just gave it to you. And then you distribute it for me. So now you own it. That's, that's nonsense. Um, an artist should have complete control over their work. So before you sign a contract, if that contract says you don't have control over your like, liking, your music, or anything that's sensible as being an artist, that's sensible for you as just basic needs for someone involved in the music business, do not sign the contract. Fight for what you deserve. But here's the problem. Again, it goes back to the talent. These labels are stupid. They're, they're trying to find artists that they can control. A person like you or I who know what our worth is musically or artistically, you can't control a person like that. But a person that can carry, just carry a tune or a person that can just somewhat act. If I offer you $200,000, and a 360 deal to where everything you do commercially, I get 10% of. And that $2,000 is going to get you out of the hood. You're going to sign it. Hey, you barely have talent anyway. They're going to help you out to make it look as if you're bigger than what you actually are. You're going to sign it. And so those are the type of people that are being signed to labels. Those are and unfortunately the type of people that are being signed to um, 
uh, talent uh, companies that look for actors. Unfortunately, let's just be honest. And so I, I the, the words I say are for those who really are doing, uh, are really, who really have the talent to uh, show and prove whenever it's time to. Do not sign those contracts if it's going to corrupt you morally or if it's going to rob you uh, of your masters, of what you have created or what how Prince used to say, take your child away from you. Music, when you create something, it becomes your baby. Now imagine someone saying, now give me that. <laughs> that's man, that's like some that's like some slavery type stuff. So we 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 I know it's tough, I know it's hard, but stick to your guns and get the deal that you deserve. Um and if you can't, then make your own label. Sign yourself. Put the money into your talent. Take your credit card that's got 15K on it. Make that first album. Make it happen. Get the features you want. Do it all yourself. You have the ability to do it. You're just afraid of doing it. All it takes is determination, willpower, and faith. And it's done. And in my case, with Jehovah, anything is possible. So as long as I'm doing things that he's approves of, whatever I'm going to do, it's, it's, it's going to make it. It's going to happen. You know, if it doesn't, who cares? You know what I'm saying? Just just be true to yourself. So, you know, big ups to Taylor Swift. I hope she gets whatever she whatever she's trying to get. Um, and I hope any artist that's in her position um can get out of that situation as well. Well now you mentioned your your faith and you are open about that. You've been a practicing Jehovah's Witness since I believe the age of seventeen. And religion in general can often carry a lot of judgment, especially with artists emerging from a diverse background. How do you maintain harmony between your spiritual commitments and the secular environment that surrounds you? And are there specific obstacles or conflicts that arise as a result of your beliefs? Uh, an another dude, Robert, you you're killing these questions, bro. Another great question. Um, I re I'll just give you a small example. I recently, before I created my own label, um, I was this close to signing with a, 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 a big label in Germany. Um, they loved what I did, um, but before they could sign me, they wanted me to, con to consign to their belief systems on homosexuality. They wanted to know what my belief was on it. And, and so I just explained my beliefs. Uh, and, and, my beliefs are based on the scriptures. They're based on how the creator feels about certain situations. And I, I explained to them that um, God doesn't hate gay people. He doesn't want to kill gay people. That's not what the scriptures say. And that's just a misconception that quote unquote Christianity uh, or so-called Christianity is putting out there. Um, Jehovah hates no one. He wants no one to perish. That's what the scriptures literally says. And, and, on, and on the topic of homosexuality, it talked about in the, in the scriptures that those who've practiced that they themselves can change their lives around and, 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 and if they choose to. So it's, it's, it's a choice. We all have choices in life to make. I'm not going to knock you for making a choice that I disagree with. I'm not going to treat you any different just because you may be living a lifestyle that I might dis disagree with. We're supposed to love our neighbors, correct? The scriptures also say we're supposed to love our enemies. So even people that you dislike, you're supposed to love and treat with respect. The golden rule, correct? Treat others the way you wish to be treated. And so that that being said, nonetheless, I I, I didn't get the deal. Um, they appreciated my my response, and they and it really helped them to understand the reality of the situation. Um, uh, nonetheless, they business wise, they just didn't want to make any conflicts, I guess, with their listeners. And I totally understood it. It it, it was it was. We shook hands after the situation and, and we're all good. Um, and that's, and those are some of the issues you have to, again, I'll go back to the moral fact of certain situations. Don't, um, neglect your morality and don't allow, it's something that you totally 100% believe in. Um, stand on that. Um, and, and don't for money or anything else, uh, allow that to, to go to the wayside. Um, and so, um, that's, that's something that I, I constantly have to do because of the God that I serve. I understand that uh, Jehovah has high moral standards. Although I'm very imperfect, um, I try my best as an imperfect human being uh, to uh, follow those standards as imperfectly as possible 
or as perfectly as possible. Um, and, and in doing so, it makes the music that I create uh, different from what you may hear on the radio. I don't use profanity. I'm not going to be singing about sex and all this other stuff that's going on. I, I think that's another issue that we have to really start buckling down on uh, the amount of profanity that's used, the amount of vulgarities. Um, music is basically pornography now, man. You know, so I, I try my I, I make sure that that's not ever going to be a part of my catalog, because, again, the God I serve, I have to make sure that whatever I say, um, it's going to uh, be well with. The person that you know controls everything, um, and two, um, I don't want to bring reproach upon Jehovah's name. And and the first time, the first time I say something wrong, it's gonna be see who see who that Jehovah's Witness said. So I have to make sure that you know my music is something that I can play for my children, my my mother and father, or anybody. I want everybody to be able to enjoy the music that I create. And and, and there's a way to talk about love without being vulgar. You know, there's there's a way of, to talk about romance without being vulgar. Look, the Song of Solomon, that, that's love poetry. Look at the things that Solomon was saying to the woman that he was in love with. Right. So um, there, there's ways to doing things. And and I, I that's I think what makes it so awesome as an artist. You get to find different ways to say what you need to say without offending anyone. And so, um, you know. Being a servant of Jehovah is the most important thing in my life. There's nothing more important than my relationship with Jehovah. And so I just try to do my best as a musician um, in this field where it's now a business to not um, ever neglect uh, that. And so, you know, and hopefully, you know, in the process, I don't offend anyone because that is not my goal. I love everybody and I, I want everybody to be happy um, and I will never ever impose my uh, beliefs or the Bible's uh, a viewpoint on anyone. It's, it's all a choice. All of us have choices to make. Whatever choice you choose to make, hey, brother, I love you. It's, it's all love. Um, and, 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 I, and, I, and I hope I receive the same love for the choices that I make. And on that note, Teddy, please spill the tea on your latest album, Dinner for Two, and any of your upcoming projects. Tell us about the songs what they mean to you, where that inspiration came from. Okay. Well, I, I, I gotta be honest, man. Like, uh, this album, I was dedicated to my wife, Andrea Bryant, who I love very dearly. We've been married for 18 years. Um, and I, I, I want to bring romance. Thank, thank you, my brother. Thank you. I got four kids in it for the long haul forever, man. Um, uh, and, uh, I, I wanted to bring romance and love and adventure back to the music. And so this album I had in mind, uh, Prince's um, Under the Cherry Moon movie. Uh, if you've never seen it, it's, it's just, it's a black and white film. I think people are now falling more in love with it after the death of, of my brother. Um, but but th I wanted to have that feel to it. And also, believe it or not, one of my favorite actors, since you are an actor, um, Harrison Ford. Uh, it was one of my favorite actors all the time. And um, the Indiana Jones films, uh, one in particular being the Temple of Doom. So if you look on the front cover, I'm actually wearing the same outfit he wore on the Temple of Doom uh, at the beginning. Uh, the, the white suited tux with the nice red rose. And and also, too, I wanted the artwork to to uh, to mimic the artwork from the Indiana Jones films. And so I found a student of the original guy who did the artwork and he did the artwork for me as well. So I, I really, I, I wanted this to be a movie on wax. And so when you listen to the first song, the intro, it's me walking into a, a restaurant to meet my wife for a, a wonderful night out. And if you listen closely, the hostess behind the bar says that my wife is sitting at table 3121. For all Prince fans, y'all know what that means. So, <laughs> so I, I wanted to incorporate all those wonderful things and and then it, it plays out the entire album plays out all the way to the outro the end to where we thank the chef which was my father uh Norman Bryant um and and then we we go out for a night of dancing um but the inspiration besides those uh those little things um musically uh street soul so Carl McIntosh Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis who I think are one, two of my favorite uh, producers of all time, and of course Quincy Jones, the Dude album. If um, 
if you've never heard that album, it's hands down a classic. It's just as great as his second album. Uh, well, second for me, uh, Back on the Block. Um, it's a it's a mixture, a multi-genre album full of jazz, R&B, soul, and even some rock. Um, and so I wanted to do a multi-genre album where everybody can enjoy romance in different genres. And so on this record, we have funk, we have soul, we have neo-soul, we have uh, street soul, we have uh, alternative jazz, which again, I believe to be acid jazz. Um, and we have house music, which I, I, I adore house music. Lisa Stainsfield, CeCe Peniston. I, I love, I love that era of house music. And so I try to do all of those things, but make it mesh, make it congeal together to make it sound like one unit. And, and according to the fans, we, we've done exactly that. Um, the two singles went number one, wrapped around your finger. Wrapped Around Your Finger was an ode to Jay Dilla, James Yancey, um, also to the whole Soul Quarians vibe uh, that me and you both grew up on. Um, and, and also um, Love I'm Given, which I did with my good friend Stimulator Jones, who I believe is also another phenomenal producer and artist. Um, both of those singles went went number one on, on all the R&B charts. Um, we also... Uh, did some features uh, with Morris Mobley. I, I I say this in all general generalization. A, a, a Jedi Knight on the guitar, just spectacular. Um, he did the song um, Jennifer Two. He uh, featured featured him on that one. And we also have Stella, a uh, wonderful vocalist, German vocalist. Um, and and, 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 and I'm sorry, French vocalist. Uh, and and we were um, doing some tributes to Marvin Gaye and, and Sade. Um, and she's on the tribute that I did to Sade, who's my favorite artist. So um, we, we have so many uh, inspirations on this record. Um, and, and it Which all stems can, from... You can the clearly th hear it. You can hear those influences. You, you succeeded with flying colors on that. Thank you, brother. I, I, I appreciate that, man. It, I'm, I'm, the goal is to try to make the legends like what you do. It's, it's, even if you don't get paid, say you make absolutely zero dollars on your record, but you have the people, the likes of Melba Moore telling you she likes what you do and she posts her, your stuff on her page or, you know, Jimmy Jim and, uh, comes in on your live. And then the next day he follows you. Like, I'm like, Whoa, you know, it's all these different uh, Carl McIntosh telling you how much he loves what, you, what, what, what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm getting all these, these, these wonderful likes from artists that I adore. You know, uh, James Taylor. I'm a big fan of Michael McDonald and James Ingram. And I did a song um, that's not on this album, actually. It's it's going to be on my third one. Um, and James Taylor came into my my mentions and gave me a big thumbs up. And it, it's that makes me feel like I'm achieving the goal that I wish to achieve, which is basically just to make real music. The money will come if the music is is good. The money will come, but. Um, uh, I, I will say this: If you need inspiration uh, for any project you're, you're 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 trying to create, go back two decades. Go 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 back and listen to what we, me, and you grew up listening to, and I, I promise you, you will find that inspiration to to make something completely uh, imaginative, creative, and unique, and amazing, and new. The goal for me is always to stay away from the norm. Do do what I know gives me goosebumps. Did you know there's a scientific study done on this? For, um, there are only a certain amount of people get goosebumps from listening to music. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a scientific fact. And, and, and it's not, a, not everybody has that sensation. Um, and so when you, when you get goosebumps from the music you listen to from the past or goosebumps from the music you're creating now, that means something. Quincy Jones even said it. If the music gives you goosebumps, you know you've got something good. And so as I was creating my first and second album, that's what I was getting. I was like, okay, no matter what, somebody's going to like it. You know, might not be everybody, but somebody's going to like it. And so uh, I, Marvin Gaye, Sade, Michael McDonald, James Ingram, Al Jarreau, El DeBarge, Bobby DeBarge, Quincy Jones, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, Carl McIntosh, and Anita Baker. Th those were... Oh, and Ralph Tresvant and I'll be sure. Those were kind of, I, I was in that mode whenever I was writing and creating. 
And, and, the, and the goal is to find a way to put all those inspirations together. Um, and, and, I, and that's how I create. And so, the, and that was the inspiration, including the, the, the movie ideas. That was the inspiration for this record. And that's why, that's how you get songs like Love I'm Giving. That's how you get songs like Give Me That Love. Or that's how you get songs like Two Step or Eight, Nine, Ten, which is songs to help people battle depression in this sick world that we live in, you know, you know. Uh, and so the, the goal is, is always to make people happy and help people through this troublesome time that we're dealing with right now through music. That's what art is supposed to be for. So that's what I'm trying to do. Well, you are doing it, and you can find out more about Teddy Bryant by visiting teddybryant.com, and you can find him on various social media platforms. As we part, my friend, uh, the best era of music for you. I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess here. Is it the 80s? 100%. <laughs> <laughs> 100%. One hundred percent, and 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 the reason why I say that the seventies had wonderful uh, soul, jazz, and funk, unbeatable disco. Whether you like it or not, it was a huge part of the seventies. But disco is very much like auto tune and trap music today. It's something that everybody's just doing because it's easy to do. Um, but there were some great disco songs, though. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I believe the eighties, just as a whole, the music and the movies will never be duplicated. It, it's it, it, think of the soundtracks to some of the movies that you enjoy from the 80s, how amazing they were, you know. So for me, the 80s had it all, but it was it had so much nostalgic nuance to it that just made just makes me feel so good, you know. And 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 we can see it to this day. We have tons of there was a study and this was an article that came out. More people are buying older music than they are buying new music. More people are listening to older music than they are listening to new music. And these are young folks. And that goes to show you, look how Kate Bush blew up. I've been a Kate Bush fan since I was seven years old, right? But now now look how she blew up just from one song from Stranger Things, right? So it's like, that's what real music sounds like. That's what it does to people. It, it moves you, it makes you, it takes you to another place. You're, you're no longer in reality. And sometimes we need to get away from reality. In your field, that's what movies and, 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 and TV shows are for. To take people from reality just for a little bit to, to you know, to, to get their minds off of the troubles in life. So, yeah, I, the 80s won the zillion percent. Well, thank you, sir. This has been enlightening. I, I, this is great conversation. Great insight. I appreciate you having me, bro. And, and my brother, if you could help a brother out with that feature, man. I, I, I would really, really, I really think that both me and Brian's minds together it would be a dangerous thing. It, it really would. And I, and I have the music for him too. I'm, I'm just, I'm holding it because I, I don't want to give it to somebody else. I, I want him to be on it. It was a perfect day in spring. The grass was never greener. I picked two flowers fresh from the meadows. The breeze was nice and cool. The sun was warm and loving. I waited for some time for us to I know you're scared Scared of falling in love again But you don't have to be Because you're here with me Forgive me if all I can do is stare When I look in your eyes Make sure to like, comment, and hit subscribe on our YouTube channel so you never miss out. RXG Exclusives, hosted by Robert X. Golfin, now playing.